Continuation, Application of the Perfect Redemption Plan, Part 1 Page 85 One of the reasons the Catholics invented purgatory was because of emotionalism. It became a religion, and they were more interested in church attendance, church offerings and tithes, church buildings, than the eternal destiny of those souls. They were not bold enough to tell people, if you do not receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you are going to hell. They were also not bold enough to tell born-again Christians who practice the sins leading to death Paul listed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10 that if they do not repent, when they die, they are going to hell. So they came up with purgatory. People bought those indulgences to reduce their time spent in purgatory and it was a license for them to continue their sinful lifestyle, so when they die, the priest, instead of saying to the family that he did not give his life to Christ when he was alive, so he is in hell, or to say to the family of that born-again Christian who practiced the sins leading to death, I am not sure if your son repented of his sins leading to death before his death, so I cannot guarantee that he is in heaven. When I tell people my grandfather is in hell, but my grandmother is in heaven, it settles my stand on the gospel. No matter how much I loved my grandfather, he refused to receive Jesus Christ in his life, so he is in hell. Purgatory is a lie from the devil, and the indulgences are the lie from the Balaam spirit. If you cannot be bold to warn people about hell and heaven, you should not be in leadership at all. We have a responsibility to tell people the real truth of the gospel, the reality of hell and heaven, starting with our own family. They are free moral agents and can decide to reject it, yet we must tell them. If you are not bold enough to tell your own children that what they are doing can cost them their eternal destiny, you cannot be in leadership. Let us learn to submit to one another through the scriptures and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt us in due time. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 Let us not be like the Pharisees and scribes who thought they knew it all and nobody could teach them anything. They thought they were superior to other Jews and holier than other Jews. When you try to correct them according to the scriptures, they answer and say, You were completely born in sins and you are teaching us? And they will cast you out of their churches or groups. John 9 verse 34 Let us be of a teachable spirit. Even a baby can give us a revelation of the word of God. If you have Christian leaders who have the mindset of the Pharisees, do not despise them. They can teach you the word of God, do what they tell you to do according to the scriptures, but do not do according to their deeds. Jesus told us about the Pharisees and scribes, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not do after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Matthew 23 verse 2 to 4 Please read the Bible study on leaven in bread to see how Jesus wants you to relate to believers who are acting like scribes and Pharisees today. Peter Though he was an apostle long before Paul, he lived, ate and slept with Jesus, but when he was acting like the Pharisees by being hypocritical, Paul withstood or opposed him to his face, and Peter accepted that he was wrong. Galatians 2 So, you see, they were submitting to one another. It was not a one-way thing. When Paul and Barnabas had been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and contention arose on whether Gentiles should be first converted to Judaism before being saved, though Paul was teaching that Gentiles do not have to observe Jewish traditions, but himself and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to see the pillars of the church, James, Peter and John, and they discussed, 
and the Holy Spirit confirmed that the Gentiles should not observe Jewish traditions, Acts 15. They were submitting to one another, and Peter acknowledged the revelations Paul had from Jesus. He did not say, Brother Paul has nothing to teach us. We spent three and a half years with Jesus, but Paul never met Jesus in the flesh, and besides, he used to persecute the church. On the contrary, Peter says, Our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, that are unlearned and unstable, rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. 2 Peter 3 verse 15 to 16 Peter acknowledged that Paul's wisdom and revelation was directly from Jesus. Peter tells us from his experience, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves under the elder. Yes, all of you be subject to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5 verse 5 the Apostle John, when he was with Jesus, was in his late teens or early twenties. It is believed, according to the time he wrote his epistles, the book of Revelation, and the Gospel of John, that he was in his late nineties. So, imagine the people who were with Jesus who were far advanced in age, and saw Jesus appointing the young John as his apostle. Maybe John had to mature. Yes, and he did mature, so did the other apostles of Jesus. Maturity in spirituality has nothing to do with age, but with becoming a doer of the word of God. The other apostles of Jesus also had to submit to John, though he was very young, and John had to submit to them as well. You are an apostle the day Jesus ordained you. It does not matter what people say. Jesus ordained you, therefore believe what Jesus says about you. Submitting to one another is a process of discipleship, and Jesus commanded us to make disciples, not mere converts or churchgoers. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Method you are, intransitively to become a pupil, transitively to disciple, that is, enroll as a scholar, of all the nations, baptizing them, not just with water, but also with the Holy Ghost and fire, with evidence of speaking in tongues, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew twenty eight eighteen to twenty. The only way discipleship can work is by submitting to one another. For when you are discipled, the person does not only impart the gospel to you, but also his life or her life. One Thessalonians two verse eight. The Bible says, "Iron sharpens iron." So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Proverbs twenty seven verse seventeen. Discipleship is instituted by Jesus so that he can build a strong church. Sometimes a conversation with the right person will avoid us unnecessary mistakes because they will impart their life experience according to the word of God to us when we are down. They will give us a word of God that help them go through the same trouble. Our countenance will be brightened and the smile will come back on our faces. God can give a revelation to a baby, and unless you are humble enough to believe that God can speak through a baby and receive it, you will miss your help. God spoke to the child Samuel to speak to the high priest Eli. Eli was humble enough to receive the prophecy of the child Samuel. 1 Samuel 3 Every believer is commanded by Jesus to disciple other believers, so everybody is discipling somebody and everybody is being discipled by somebody.
It is not for us to boast that people are being willingly submissive to our authority, but it is the Lord Jesus who truly gave us this authority so that people can submit to the Lordship of Jesus as we teach them how to do so, and our God-given authority to disciple other believers is to edify them, to build them up, not to destroy them and put them down. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 8 When people come to you down, they must go back built up, edified, encouraged. If they were crying, they ought to have a smile by the time they leave you. Even when you rebuke them for their mistakes or sins, you must give them a hope that it shall be well with them according to the scriptures, if they repent. For we are prisoners of hope. Zechariah 9 verse 12 the helmet that we have on our head is the hope of salvation, hope of deliverance, hope of healing, hope of prosperity, hope of restoration. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 We cannot help it but to have hope, that it shall be well with us. Isaiah 3 verse 10 I have been to see some people and talk to them about things I was going through, and I tell you, I went back home more depressed and with greater condemnation and unbelief than before I went to see them. I did not go back to them because I knew they were not supposed to put condemnation and unbelief in my heart, but to speak the truth to me in love, to build up my faith or belief and give me hope that God had already made a provision for me, because no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 But having said that, I tell you the truth, people are human and they make mistakes. The perfect comfort that you will ever receive is the comfort of Jesus through his written word. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15 verse 4 I have given people counsel, and when they left, the Holy Spirit told me, You said the truth, but you did not speak it in love, to allow them to grow up to become like Christ in all things. Ephesians 4 verse 15 For they are still baby Christians. So I had to call them, for I know they are afraid to call me back, for they think I am angry, which is not the case and most of the time they come back. Some people have given me counsel, and I was more depressed as I said, but I know that in their heart they genuinely loved me and cared for me, so I decided to go back to them and submit to the word of God that came out of their mouth, not to their traditions and customs. You will understand that we all have different upbringings and different traditions and customs, but there is a biblical tradition and a biblical custom which is according to the scriptures. And they have nothing to do with the Jewish traditions and customs that made the commandment of God of no effect. Matthew 16 verse 6 Gentile believers were forbidden to copy Jewish traditions and customs, so you are also forbidden to copy Brother G's traditions and customs. Yet we are all commanded to obey and follow God's traditions and customs which are found in His written word. So I had to learn that many believers wanted to impose their traditions and customs on me which have nothing to do with the word of God and sometimes their traditions and customs even violate the word of God. I told them, I love you, but your traditions and customs do not line up with the word of God so I do not have to obey them. Many did not like what I said but I decided to obey the word of God. Respect people's traditions and customs, but if they violate the word of God, do not even submit to them for an hour. But if they do not violate the word of God, you can decide to submit to them willingly. Let nobody force you or put it as a condition for you to follow their traditions and customs before they allow you among them. 
obey and respect people's traditions and customs that do not violate the word of God because you want to stay among those brothers and sisters. But if you feel uncomfortable, it is better to find someone else to disciple you, for two cannot walk together except they be agreed. Amos 3 verse 3 when we disciple people, there comes a time that the disciple knows almost everything we know, and they truly do not need us as a disciple anymore, but more as a friend. It is just like parents and children. As children grow up, they know almost everything the parents know. So they are now friends, and when we sit together, it is to fellowship, not to teach them. And many people fail to understand that their disciples are no longer baby disciples, but they are mature believers now and need to be addressed and respected as such and given different attention. We must learn to turn people loose, not to yoke them to always come back to us. When we have poured out our gospels and life to those disciples, because they build on our foundations and do not have to reinvent the wheel, some of them will have greater revelation than we had. Some of them will experience more of the power of God than we had, because they got the truth early in their walk of faith. We must be like Jesus, who is a secure leader, and told us, Whoever believes in me, the works that I do, you shall do, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. John 14 verse 12 After he had taught his disciples for three and a half years, he told them, You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord does, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. John 15 verse 14 to 15 When we have poured ourselves out with the gospel and our life, we have told them everything God told us, and now our disciples are also obeying the word of God, just like we are obeying the word of God, they are doing the same miracles and even greater miracles. We should see them as friends now, for truly they have nothing to learn from us, but they are truly sharpening us like we are sharpening them. I remember leaving home when my younger brother was still in high school, and I'd not seen him for many years. In my mind, he was still my baby brother, and even the tone I used when I spoke to him was always a tone of the overly protective elder brother. I had a picture of him in my mind that was no longer him, and many times when I would talk to him, it was always to advise him, for most of the time he was following in my footsteps. But I realized that he did not like it anymore because I had failed to see that he was no longer that baby brother who was following in my footsteps, but he had matured. And I changed my tone with him. I trusted his judgments and learned to let go and turn him loose. When you love people, you do not want to let go. I remember when growing up, if you touched one of my brothers or said something against them, it was as if you had said it to me. I had made it my personal issue. Learn to let go. People gravitate where they are loved and respected or reverenced. That is why God says, Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Ephesians 5 verse 33 Paul explains to us that he was not talking about marriage, but about Christ and his church. In every relationship where submission is demanded, first there must be love and second reverence. We submit to Jesus because we know how much he loves us and his love for us is what compels us to obey his commandments and they are not grievous to us for we love him because he first loved us and demonstrated his love for us by dying on the cross. And in return, Jesus asks us to love and reverence him. Reverence is fear mingled with respect and esteem. So for believers, we are supposed to submit to one another, so those two components must be involved in discipleship, love and reverence, and they must be reciprocal. If you sense that a person does not love you, 
Do not go under that person to be discipled. It will not work. Many disciples are successful in loving their disciples, but it is in the area of reverence that they fail. They believe, since they are the one imparting the gospel and their love to the disciples, that they have to be reverenced, but not the disciples. Many times when the disciples have learned what God had to teach them through that discipler, God tells them to leave, for they cannot become friends with that disciple. Friendship is the next step of discipleship. People will stay with you because you love them, respect them, and esteem them. Honor, according to the Webster Dictionary, is the esteem due to someone or something said or something done. The Lord says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me for ever. But now the Lord says, Be it far from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. 1 Samuel 2 verse 30 You see, God made an everlasting covenant with Eli's father's house that he should walk with them, but he changed his mind when he saw that the people were not truly esteeming who he was and what he had done for them. Thus he said, Now things would be different if you esteem my person and what I have done for you, I will go before you, come to you and stay with you. I will esteem your person and what you do for me. But if you despise me, I will lightly esteem you. Jesus did not minister a lot in his hometown because they did not honor him, esteem his person and what he did. It is the same thing with people we disciple. If we do not esteem their persons and what they do for us, they will stop walking with us. Paul tells us, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Romans 13 verse 7 we render to all the honor due to them. If God honors us when we honor him, and it is a reciprocal honor, who are we to not give honor back to the people who are following us as we follow Christ? 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 None of us is as important as God. If God honors his children back, we all ought to honor one another. God Though he is the one who did everything for us by sending Jesus to die on the cross, though he is the one who works in us, both to will and do for his good pleasure, and we honor him for all that, yet he honors us back and does not take us for granted. Philippians 2 verse 13 Many refuse to allow him to work through them. So he says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Hebrews 6 verse 10 Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's. Name anything you have sacrificed for the sake of the gospel. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time of the things you have sacrificed for the sake of the gospel, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Mark 10 verse 29 to 30. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, which the Gentiles are chasing after, shall be added unto you. Matthew 6 verse 33 In fact, all the promises of God contained in the Bible are God's ways of honoring us for honoring him by obeying his word. All the downcast and outcast and the apostles were willing to follow Jesus to the death because they not only knew they were loved unconditionally by Jesus, but they knew that they were respected and esteemed. 
They were not nobodies in the eyes of God. To show us how much Jesus loves us, respects us, and esteems us as his friends and brothers and sisters, he gave us the perfect redemption plan. Please do read it over and over again. He seated us together with him in heavenly places. We are not seated behind him, no. We are seated with him. He made us joint heirs with him. He gave us his power and his authority. He literally shares everything he has with us. How much love, respect and esteem do you want to receive from a person, knowing that that person bought you from the slave market? For once we used to be slaves of sin and of Satan, but Christ ransomed us in full with his blood. Many disciples fail to bring their disciples to stand side by side with them, even little children. If you love them, give them respect, and do not belittle everything they have to say. They will keep coming back to you, for they know their opinion counts. You respect and esteem their person and their inputs in your life. For truth be said, the disciple contributes more in the growth of the discipler. It is a win-win relationship that must be transformed into friendship with love, respect and esteem for both parties. For Paul himself confessed to the church in Thessalonica, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter had tempted you, and our labour be in vain. But now, when Timothy came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, or unconditional love, and that you have good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 4 to 10 the disciple-disciple relationship is also to pray for one another. You do not have to pray together all the time. You can pray in different locations. People think because a person is a disciple that his prayers are more important than the prayers of the disciple. It is not true. Even the prayer of a baby is as important to God as the prayer of an apostle. James tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. James 5 verse 16 Every born-again believer has been made righteous, even the righteousness of Jesus. Nobody can add to the righteousness of God. So, a born-again baby Christian has the same righteousness as Jesus, and his righteousness is the same righteousness the Apostle has. That is why his prayer avails much to God, because it is not based on his works of righteousness, but on the righteousness of Jesus that has been imputed to all of us. Paul acknowledged that the prayers of his disciples would free him from his bonds. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 19 Brethren, pray for us. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 25 Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1 to 2 
many times when my father who begot me in the Lord, Apostle Jean-Francois Ngemba, is in danger in a country at war in Africa, or has been arrested for preaching the gospel, or has been poisoned in his food by some envious so-called pastors, the Lord shows me what is happening, and sometimes takes me in the spirit to where he is, and I pray for his deliverance or healing. After his deliverance, he calls me and tells me it was exactly how God showed me. Or, sometimes another of my fathers in the Lord is under demonic attack. It is almost being overpowered by the enemy. He asks God in his prayer, God, wake Jerry up to stand in the gap. And at the same minute that he prays that prayer, the Lord wakes me up and I start binding and loosing miles away. And the next day he calls me and asks me if the Lord woke me up at 1.35 a.m. I say, yes, and he tells me that he asked God to wake me up. In my case as well, when I am going through difficult times of battles, God tells my father who begot me in the Lord, and he stands in the gap. And the next day when I call him, he tells me what God told him about me. Or he shows my mother or my father, and they call me and tell me the Lord showed them that I was crying, and it was true. When Paul says to the Corinthian church, I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 3 It was not a figure of speech, no. God literally brought him there in the spirit to see what was happening, so though he was not there in his body but in his spirit he was there. And many times that is what God does with me, and I describe to people what the things in their house are, and what they are hiding, though I've physically never been to their house or their country. Or what the meeting they attended was, and what the decisions taking were, though I was not there physically. Elisha saw and heard all the military strategies that the king of Syria was devising with his generals in his bedroom, though Elisha had never set foot in Syria. In other words, Elisha was present in the king's bedroom in the spirit. 2 Kings 6 verse 8 to 12 You see, brothers and sisters, if my spiritual fathers did not understand that my prayers avail much, that they need me as much as I need them, they would be suffering unnecessarily. I know everybody who takes their time to read these Bible studies are praying for me, as I am praying and fasting for them, and if you have not been praying for me, please start doing so. I desperately need your prayers, they avail much, move mountains and break chains. Pray for me in these three areas. God will keep me, Jerry, from sexual scandal. God will keep me from financial scandal. And God will keep me from damnable heresies. Many times people whom I disciple would call me and they would share a testimony of what God has done in their life and how they are resisting the devil, even when I was down and crying. After I finished talking with them, my own faith was boosted. So, sometimes when I call the people, I have the God-given privilege to disciple. It is not because they need my help or my teaching. No, it is because I need to hear about their faith and what God is doing with them, for I am personally down. Many people will not tell you that, but I thank God that Paul had the courage and honesty to put it in writing, that this discipleship relationship is for mutual benefit. When I was down, God told me to call people whom I disciple, or he sent me someone who needed help. I did not know it at first, but that was a way for God to help me, by me helping someone else. I did not feel like doing it at first, but I noticed as I was helping them, I was becoming stronger myself. So I asked God, how can this be? And last year, in 2011, he gave me the answer that Paul already wrote to the church in Thessalonica. I needed them more than they needed me. And night and day I prayed that God would give them victories so that their victories will keep propelling my faith. Yes, 
This is one of the fastest ways God uses for you to be filled with the Spirit. He wants us to submit to one another. He wants us to be discipled and us to disciple somebody. I believe this is the way that makes it easy for rivers of living water to flow out of your belly. Why do you think preachers have more miracles than other believers? It is because God keeps sending people their way who need help, and as they preach and minister to those people's needs, they themselves are being filled and have overflowing rivers of living water. That is why many preachers will only pray for your problems after they have first preached to you, because after they have preached to you, they themselves are filled with the Spirit, meaning under a strong influence of the Holy Spirit to speak and act with boldness, in line with the written word of God. As long as there is a demand on the rivers of living water in you, they will be flowing out of you. If there is no demand, you will be only experiencing a fountain of living water springing up to everlasting life. In the story of the widow who came to Elisha, because the creditors had come to collect their money and she had none, they decided to take her two sons to be slaves if she could not pay. She had a little jar of oil in her house. The man of God, Elisha, told her to go and borrow empty vessels, not a few but plenty of empty vessels, and pour the oil that was in that little jar into all the empty vessels. As long as there were empty vessels to be filled, the oil of the little jar kept coming out. The miraculous oil from the jar stopped flowing out when all the empty vessels were filled. 2 Kings 4 You think what you know is little, or the power of God is little in you. That is a lie of the devil. As you start ministering to people in the word of God in prayer, God will do mighty miracles, signs and wonders through you. And as long as there are people in need of ministration, the rivers of living water and the anointing of God will continue to flow through you to bring deliverance, healing and salvation to as many people as come your way, even the millions of souls in the 50 European nations. The more you share the word of God with people, the more God gives you revelation about the scriptures and what will address their problem. The more you lay hands on people, the more God heals them. To be continued.